We have artillery. Yes. Thank you. We have it. Is it enough? Honestly, not really. <laughs> to ensure Bakhmut is not just a stronghold that holds back the Russian army, but for the Russian army to completely pull out more cannons and shells are needed. If so, just like the Battle of Saratoga, the fight for Bakhmut will change the trajectory of our war for independence and for freedom. That was Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky addressing a joint meeting of Congress December 21st, 2022. He cited the Battle of Saratoga. Fought in 1777, Saratoga was a turning point in the Revolutionary War. The American defeat of the superior British Army lifted Patriot morale, furthered the hope for independence, and helped secure foreign support needed to win the war. In 2022, President Zelensky came to Congress to urge more U.S. military assistance in his battle against the Russian invasion. He shrewdly reached all the way back to the Revolutionary War for an American comparison to what Ukraine faces and could accomplish. You learn a lot from foreign leaders addressing Congress global affairs in general, U.S. relations with the specific country the leader represents, and often our own history. Yes, sometimes these speeches are a solid opportunity to brush up on American history, particularly from the early days. In this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly, we remember U.S. history from foreign leaders addressing our own Congress. The first foreign leader who addressed Congress, the Marquis de Lafayette, France's Revolutionary War hero spoke to the House on December 10, 1824. President Zelensky's 2022 speech was the 74th time a foreign leader addressed Congress in person inside the chamber since 1979, when C-SPAN began. President Zelensky also was the third Ukrainian to address Congress. The other two offered reminders of early U.S. history as well. The first Ukrainian, Viktor Yushchenko, April 6, 2005. He also was the first leader of a former Soviet republic outside of Russia to address Congress. And he spoke less than three months after becoming president. He wore an orange tie, symbolizing the Orange Revolution, massive protests against electoral corruption, and delivering his address in Ukrainian with a simultaneous translation in English, President Yushchenko, like President Zelensky 17 years later, referred to the American Revolutionary War. On the wall of this great building, there is a Latin phrase that means, out of many, one. This motto reminds the world about the American Revolution, the starting point of the modern world's history of liberty. My road here went through the orange-colored Independence Square that became known as Maidan. Millions of people standing there continuously repeated, together we are many, we cannot be defeated. This motto of the Ukrainian revolution is a reminder of the fact that freedom continues to win. Ukraine is opening a new page in the world's chronicle of liberty in the 21st century. The second Ukrainian president to address Congress, Petro Poroshenko, September 18, 2014, and like President Yushchenko, and like President Zelensky, President Poroshenko referred to the Revolutionary War. Live free or die was one of the mottos of the American Revolutionary War. Live free or die was the spirit of the revolutionary on the Maidan during the dramatic winter month of 2014, with the significant presence of the member of United States Congress, and we thank you for that. Live free or die are words of Ukrainian soldiers standing on line of freedom on this war. Live free must be the answer with which Ukraine comes out of this war. Live free must be the message Ukraine and America sent to the world while standing together in this time of enormous challenge. Thank you. Islava Ukraine. A different kind of reference to the American War of Independence from Tony Blair. The British Prime Minister addressed a joint meeting 
on July 17, 2003. A few weeks earlier, Congress awarded Prime Minister Blair a gold medal, which was a great transition to remind us about this period of U.S. history, utilizing classic British deadpan wit. Mr. Speaker, sir, my thrill on receiving this award was only a little diminished on being told that the first congressional gold medal was awarded to George Washington for what Congress called his wise and spirited conduct in getting rid of the British out of Boston. (laughs) On our way down here, Senator Frist was kind enough to show me the, the fireplace where in 1814 the British had burnt the Congress Library. I know this is kind of late, but sorry. (laughs) Actually, you know, my middle son was studying 18th century history in the American War of Independence, and he said to me the other day, you know Lord North, Dad, He was the British Prime Minister who lost us America. So just think, however many mistakes you'll make, you'll never make one that bad. (laughs) So that was early American history from a British perspective. For a French recollection, we go to an April 25th, 2018 joint meeting of Congress. Here's Emmanuel Macron, President of France. We have fought shelter to shelter many battles starting with those that gave birth to the United States of America. Since then, we have shared a common vision for humanity. Our two nations are rooted in the same soil, grounded in the same ideals of the American and French revolutions. We have worked together for the universal ideals of liberty, tolerance, and equal rights. And yet, This is also about how human, gutsy, personal bonds throughout history. In 1778, the French philosopher Voltaire and Benjamin Franklin met in Paris. John Adams tells the story that after they had shaken hands, they embraced each other by hugging one another in their arms and kissing each other's cheeks. It can remind you something. (laughs) And this morning, I stand under the protective gaze of Lafayette, right behind me. As a brave young man, he fought alongside George Washington and forged a tight relationship fueled by respect and affection. Lafayette used to call himself a son of the United States. And in 1792, George Washington became a son of America and France when our first republic awarded citizenship to him. A history footnote. By mentioning the Battle of Saratoga, Ukrainian President Zelensky invoked the Revolutionary War but he did not do what French President Macron did, mention Lafayette, who gave us critical assistance and now is in the House chamber, at least his portrait is. Emmanuel Macron also mentioned John Adams. So too did Shimon Peres. The Prime Minister of Israel addressed a joint meeting of Congress December 12, 1995. For us, the vast discovery of America is its constitution even more than its continent, the Constitution, enriched by its biblical foundation. From our school days, we remember the proposal of John Adams that the imagery of ancient Israel captivated the Constitutional Congress in 1776. We recalled Benjamin Franklin's idea to incorporate in the great seal of the new confederation the image of Moses raising his staff, dividing the Red Sea. 
we remembered Thomas Jefferson suggesting that the image of the children of Israel struggling through the wilderness led by a pillar of cloud by day, by a pillar of fire by night, that this image be the symbol of the young republic to become the great republic. By the way, a second history footnote, prime ministers and presidents from Israel have addressed joint meetings of Congress eight times, but Ukraine President Zelensky was the first Jewish leader of a country other than Israel to address a joint meeting of Congress. Shimon Peres cited Thomas Jefferson, so too Vashlov Havel. In fact, when he addressed Congress on February 21, 1990, less than two months after becoming president of a democratic Czechoslovakia following the end of communist rule, the Jefferson mention was the only part of the speech Vashlov Havel gave in English. <clears throat> when Thomas Jefferson wrote that governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the cons consent of the, of the governed, it was a simple and important act of the human spirit. What gave meaning to the, that act, however, was the fact that the author backed it up with his life. It was not just his words. It was his deeds as well. As a former political prisoner, Václav Havel brought a unique perspective to his congressional address. So too, Nelson Mandela. The former political prisoner in South Africa addressed Congress June 26, 1990, the first of two times he spoke there. Mandela also became the first black private citizen to speak to a joint meeting of Congress. Already engaged with the work of shaping the new South Africa after his release from prison and the end of apartheid, Mandela reached back to the beginning of America. The day may not be far when we will borrow the words of Thomas Jefferson and speak of the will of the South African nation. In the exercise of that will by this united nation of black and white people, it must surely be that they will be born a country on the southern tip of Africa, which you will be proud to call a friend and an ally because of his contribution to the universal striving towards liberty, human rights, prosperity, and peace among the peoples. <clears throat> now, Angela Merkel. The German Chancellor addressed Congress November 3, 2009, shortly before the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Chancellor Merkel closed her address by referring to a famous artifact of the Revolutionary War. You'll hear her remarks begin in German with a translator. Then, midway through, she dramatically switches to her own voice in English, just like Václav Havel did. Ladies and gentlemen, my confidence is nurtured and comes from a very important source, a very special sound, the sound of the Liberty Bell in Schöneberg Town Hall in Berlin. Since 1950, the bell cast after the original American Liberty Bell hangs there in the belfry, a gift from American citizens. It is a symbol of the promise of freedom, a promise that has been fulfilled. On the 3rd of October 1990, the Liberty Bell rang again, signaling unification of Germany, the greatest moment of joy for the, Amer for the German people. On the 13th of September 2001, it tolled out again, two days after 9-11, the greatest day of mourning for the American people. The Freedom Bell in Berlin is, like the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, a symbol which reminds us that freedom does not come about of itself. It must be struggled for and then defended anew every day of our lives. In this endeavor, Germany and Europe will also in future remain strong 
and dependable partners for America. That I promise you. Thank you very much. And finally, earlier we heard from Tony Blair. He was not the first British Prime Minister to address Congress. Winston Churchill was. December 26, 1941, as America entered World War II. In fact, Churchill appeared again barely a year and a half later, May 19, 1943, and a third time in 1952. Churchill's three addresses to Congress is a record tied only by current Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which takes us to Queen Elizabeth. She addressed the joint meeting of Congress on May 16, 1991, the first British monarch to address Congress. She opened with a reference to a legendary American leader, but not from Revolutionary War days. I know what a rare privilege it is to address a joint meeting of your two houses. Thank you for inviting me. The concept, so simply described by Abraham Lincoln, as government by the people, of the people, for the people, is fundamental to our two nations. Your Congress and our Parliament are the twin pillars of our civilizations, and the chief among the many treasures that we have inherited from our predecessors. And now, a bonus clip. We noted that three different presidents of Ukraine have addressed a joint meeting of Congress. For balance, has any Russian leader done so? Yes. Boris Yeltsin, president of Russia, June 17, 1992. And he cited a famous American historical figure. And although Irving Berlin was born a century after the Revolutionary War, we include him here because his words inspired President Yeltsin to express a sentiment we may not hear from a Russian leader for a long, long time. So, from 1992, through a translator, here's Russian President Boris Yeltsin's rousing, standing ovation spurring conclusion to his address to a joint meeting of Congress. I would like now to conclude my statement with the words from a song by Irving Berlin, an American of Russian descent, God Bless America, to which I add, and Russia. That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly. A reminder, you can do your own searches in the C-SPAN video library. Watch more foreign leaders address joint meetings of Congress. We have their videos going back to 1989. Amazingly, four in 1989, including, from November 1989, Polish Solidarity Leader Lech Walesa, a week after the Berlin Wall fell. Accompanied by a translator, here's how Lech Walesa, the third foreign non-head of state to address Congress, opened his remarks. Panie Przewodniczący Izby Reprezentantów, Panie Prezydencie, Szanowni członkowie obu izb kongresu, panie i panowie. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the cabinet, distinguished members of the House and Senate. My, naród. We, the people. Thanks for listening and happy searching. <laughs>